Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful that we can come into your presence just by our own worthlessness. We have no right, but yet through your mercy and your grace, you have given us the opportunity, yea, the privilege, and the power to be able to come boldly to the throne of grace. Guide direct now, Lord, with these different requests we put before you. I pray that you'd work in our lives and challenge us and help us. Help us, O oh Lord, to be a light to those around us. Help us as we focus on missions now that you give us wisdom. Guide direct now. Touch our lives. Help us. Pray just again for these different requests. Pray that you'd work in each and every case. Have your hand upon us. Be the service ahead for ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. All right. I think what we're going to go ahead and do is keep everything on schedule. We're not going to do a missionary uh, letter tonight. We're going to have her uh, speaker tonight. So we're going to go ahead and do a song, and I think our, our song leader will be here in just a moment. But we'll go ahead and get started tonight. Let me grab the book. So if you can turn to page 362. Rescue the Perishing, 362. Okay, guess that wasn't Ryan. All right. Anyway, why don't you stand and join me? 362, rescue the perishing. We'll plan on doing all four verses. Get it now. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep for the erring one, lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, touched by the tempter, Feelings that buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness. Chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Amen. You may be seated. And um, has Ryan showed up? Okay, he is. Okay, that's why I thought that second car was him. Uh, let me go ahead and make a couple announcements, and I'll let him do the next verse, next song here. But... Um, Just a second. Do you want to just remind everybody we will be having service tomorrow night, not our normal schedule. Tonight's our normal schedule, but we're preempting it for a 
our missionary speaker tonight. We're having Brother Alan Hart with us. Look forward to, to hearing from him again. And then tomorrow night we have Tad LaGrosse that will be with us 7 p.m. Uh, tomorrow night here. And then Friday night we have mission, uh, missions dinner. Richard Crotz III will be uh, uh, giving an update. Uh, he's in town and able to get him to come. He's going to come be a part of that. So remember, uh, last chance to sign up here. Uh, give us a good count on people. Uh, well, I guess tonight, tomorrow night, we need to get a count on how many people are attending and, and try to line up the potluck. Uh, be sure to sign up for that. And then, if you can, we'd like to present uh, Richard with a uh, love offering that night. If you can help join us with that, greatly appreciate it. And then next Sunday, we'll be doing Faith Promise Mission Sunday. We've got the new uh, Faith Promise cards ready to go. And uh, thank for Stephen and Gina for helping with that. But i uh, got Faith Promise ready to go. And we'll be uh, focusing on Faith Promise during the Sunday school hour. And I'll be also preaching the morning service and focusing on that. So be sure to be there and be a part of that. Uh, again, Daylight Savings Time is going to change this weekend. So um, you'll get an extra hour. So you can sleep an extra hour or you can just leave your clock alone and come early for Sunday school. Yeah, that's okay with me too. So either way, come be a part of that, uh, and the rest of the announcements we'll catch up on. But I want to focus on those for the, the uh, um, mission. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and uh, let me get. Okay, that's the easy one. We'll just do this one a cappella too. Uh, I don't know what happened there. But uh, 377 is Set My Soul Afire. 377, set my soul afire. Just has three verses on this one, I think, but uh, hopefully that's what you have back there. Set my soul afire. Set, okay. When you're ready, everybody got eyeballs to I'll let you sit down if you sing out, okay? Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy holy word. Burn it deep within me, let thy voice be heard. Millions grope in darkness in this day and hour. I will be your witness, fill me with thy power. Set my soul afire, Lord. Set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grope in darkness, waiting for thy word. Set my soul afire, Lord. Set my soul afire, set my soul afire, Lord, for the lost in sin. Give to me a passion as I seek to win. Help me not to falter, never let me fail. Fill me with thy spirit, let thy will prevail. Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grope in darkness, waiting for thy word. Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Set my soul afire, Lord, in my daily life. Far too long I've wandered in this day of strife. 
nothing else will matter but to live for thee. I will be your witness, for Christ lives in me. Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grope in darkness, waiting for thy word. Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Amen. My purpose is to get to the preaching. We're going to do very similar tomorrow night. We'll have just a couple songs and get right into the preaching. This time I'd like for Brother Alan Hart to come and looking forward to hearing from him again. We've developed a relationship here the last couple of years. We met him at a conference and, and uh, just blessed and looking forward to it. He has been a longtime missionary in both Portugal and, and Mozambique. And uh, yes. that and uh but he's been a long time missionary in both portugal and mozambique uh he's been back up here for three three and a half years, three and a half years, three and, a half years. and uh been a blessing he's been able to speak for us a couple different times already and just i am just enjoy his fellowship and whenever we get together for lunch or something i enjoy just getting to to pick his brain and talk to him about things from a missionary point of view so looking forward to it, and I just told him, hey, preach to us, so looking forward to it tonight. I'm going to hush if you're ready. We're going to turn it over to him. Amen. It will be. have to get used to these things because in Portugal and in Africa we didn't have uh, any kind of amplification speakers microphones you know I don't know where to plug it in out under the mango tree and um, too many times even in our city church we didn't have power because the power would go off on Sunday so you could work on it since nobody's doing anything important on Sunday and uh, <laughs> you know so it began to be a problem good evening church it's good to see you all. It's good to be in the house of God. And uh, hi, young man. How are you? I know who you are. <laughs> I'll recognize everybody. You, you look familiar, too. It may just be the beard. Do you have a number under you somewhere? Like post office or something? Okay. That doesn't even mean anything anymore. They don't have those in the post office anymore. Like federal warrant cards, you know. <laughs> That's where... Never mind. It's where I used, I got my picture out of there to put on the prayer card. So um, I just had to kind of scratch out the numbers. And it is, uh, it's good to be here with you. This is the third time that your pastor has invited me to come and be a part of your conference. And uh, of course, last year I saw the building. First year we were over in the rental property. And, uh, but it was good. It was good to be with the church. And it's good to be with uh, Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, last year we still had some scaffolding, I think. We didn't have all the cloud panels up yet and all of that, but uh, I congratulate you once again. The church is beautiful, and uh, uh, you know, God is good all the time, and uh, I, I am, um, in heart, I think I'll probably always be a missionary, um, and I, when I say missionary, I mean church planner, planting churches in a place where quite often uh, there is no gospel witness. Uh, I've been in places where uh, people had never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. A uh, number of the places we went to in Africa, uh, people just didn't know. 
And even though there were churches in the country and maybe even the same province like state, uh, you can imagine if, if, the, if the closest preacher was, you know, halfway across the state in, 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 or towards Colorado or something, you know, if it's halfway across the state towards Missouri, it's not very far. We drove over from Raytown, so I know it's not very far, but, but you go out to Hayes, and that Hayes is a little ways from here, you know. And um, if you promise not to tell anybody, I'll let you know that I was born here in Kansas City, Kansas. In fact, we lived on South 47th Drive, which I think is not that far from where we are right now. And, um, you know, just make sure that you don't tell anybody. So people in Missouri will revoke my exit visa for me to come over here into Kansas again, you know. And so um, <laughs> thank you. I mean, yeah, to revoke it. Don't let him back. <laughs> I know who my friends are, brother, you know. But we are very thankful. We had a missionary in our church over in, in, in we're, we're in Kansas City, but we're on just on the other side of the stadiums. Uh, cut off, uh, Blue Ridge Cutoff is the stadium drive, and we're the next road, north-south road, the next road to the east. So we're, we're just over there, and uh, we had a missionary to Thailand. He's been in Thailand some 32 years, I think he said. I've known him for 20 years and uh, doing, a, doing a great job. And I'm very thankful for those who are willing to dedicate their lives. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of folks that go for a year and come back, but I, I'm glad for some that have dedicated their lives and just stay. And I'm very thankful. It's a good testimony to me uh, now that I'm a pastor to know that there are men that will take their families and they will go to die on the field. And uh, I hope they don't die on the field. I hope they get to come back and, you know, eat Fritos once again. Um, so, but it's, it's good to know that people are dedicated, dedicating their lives still to the, the endeavor of missions, church planting, planting churches and, and communities. And uh, you'll forgive me my very narrow bias. Please forgive me. But to me, a missionary is someone who's planting a church. And uh, I know the word missionary, there's only, I only have one Bible in my library that has the word missionary in it. And I wrote it there because they were trying to take my Bible away. And I said, no, this is the missionary's Bible. So I wrote missionary in the front cover. And that's the only one that has it. So we have to be descriptive. Let me ask you a couple of questions to get going here. And I'm, I'm watching Mickey Mouse with his hands up there on the wall. I really don't have glasses on, Seth. So if it gets close to nine o'clock, somebody stand up and wave at me, okay? Uh, joking. Let me ask you a couple of questions tonight. Are you involved in the church's program of evangelizing the world? Now, I don't want answers. I want you to think about it. Are you involved in this church's program of evangelizing the world? Because I'm going to talk to you tonight about participation in world evangelization. I know for sure that God hasn't called all of you to go to some foreign field and spend the rest of your life in some place planting churches. But he may have called some of you. And I know that he's called people out of this church. He's called men and they've taken their families. And some are preparing to do that. Are you involved in evangelizing the neighborhood of the local church? Now, you might not live right here down the street. You might not live on Outlook or you might not live right here in the neighborhood. But are we evangelizing our neighbor's in the work of this church? Good question for us. What are we doing to help get the gospel to the people who have not heard? Whether they're in Kansas City, Mission, or whether they're across the world somewhere. What are we doing? Let me also begin by making a couple of statements concerning our involvement and our participation in the process of getting the gospel to the world. First of all, Missions, if I can call it that, missions, and I think this church knows a little bit about missions. You're, you've, you've got a wall full of missionary letters up there. You've got Faith Promise Program. You've got a pastor who's got a heart for missions that talks about it constantly, and he's informed. Missions is not a spectator sport. You know, if I go over to the stadiums, I'm, I've never been in there. I, I don't know what they look like on the inside. I think they're red and yellow and blue and something. I don't know. Um, and it's, I don't know, who, who is that, the chefs that play over there or something? 
Somebody, somebody can tell me after church, because I don't know anything about it. Uh, some second-rate team or something. I don't know. Go Broncos. So, you know, there's a bias here. Missions is not a spectator sport. Listen, when I go to the football stadium and I pay whatever, I don't know, $250 to sit in the nosebleed section and $15 hot dog and a $20 Coke or whatever it is, I'm a spectator. Even if I was to put a cheese on my head, I know that that doesn't go here, but those are cool hats, the cheese head hats, you know. I'm still a spectator. I don't affect what goes on. You know, the quarterback doesn't look up and go, hey, hi, oh, you're here, you're cheering for me, thank you, I'm going to play better now. I, I, you know, I'm just a, a no-name, no-face person who paid too much for a hot dog sitting in the stand. You know, in, in those kind of things, even when we were in Portugal and we had players in our church, you know, occasionally one of the guys would go, oh, you're here, great, and just keep on going. I mean, I'm still a spectator. I'm their pastor, you know. I got free tickets, that's a cool thing, but you know, they weren't $250 tickets either. They were like $3 tickets. Um, but missions is not a spectator sport. We can't just sit on the outside and look in and cheer them on and say, go, go, go. Because the mission of this church is not just going on in Cambodia or the other side of the world. Vietnam, New Guinea, France and Japan, and I couldn't even name all of them. And, and the mission work of this church and missions of this is also in the, in the planting and starting of new churches, even in this community or in this area or this state, maybe the next state, maybe Iowa, I don't know, maybe Nebraska. Missions is not a spectator sport. Evangelism is not the responsibility of the pastor and the leaders in the church. Evangelism is not the responsibility solely of the pastor and the leaders in the church. There's tracks back there, I noticed, I saw them. Little pieces of paper with the gospel message on them. There's not a person in here that can't take one of those pieces of paper and give it to somebody else. Now we used to put them in our bills, but you, know, you don't pay bills mail anymore. That's so old-fashioned, you know. Um, I still have some things, but I, I tell my bank to send the check, and they send it free, and I don't even have to pay stamps, so. But we lose the opportunity to put a tract in there. You say, well, that person will never read that, and, you know, it'll never have any effect. Don't just tell that to everybody. Army Captain Gordy Geisinger He's digging in the back of his truck camper, retired captain of the Army, digging in the back of his camper to find a gun to shoot himself. And I apologize for saying that. We have sensitive ears here tonight, but that's what he was doing. When he was digging around in there, a paper fell out, fell on the floor. He picked it up, he read it, he bowed his head, and he prayed and put his trust in Jesus Christ. He spent the rest of his life passing out gospel tracts all over this world. Somewhere above 10 million gospel tracts by himself. He had a postal bag and he would go to a community, even in a place where he came to Portugal when I was there in the Air Force, and that's where I got to know him, and he would go downtown. None of us spoke Portuguese. Only our missionary pastor spoke Portuguese. None of us spoke the language. He had a little big postal bag and he'd just stuff it full of tracts and he'd go down to the main square and just hand them out until he didn't have any handout left. Why? Because he knew it worked. And if you're here tonight and you're born again and you're saved and you know you're saved, you know it works. You know what forgiveness is. You know what redemption is. You know what justification is. And, and if you don't, you can get a dictionary and remind yourself, you know, I mean, sometimes we let those things slip, but we know what it means to be saved if you're saved tonight. So you can tell somebody else. Don't say that you can't do anything. Don't say, I can't do anything. The most feeble widow in the church can pray. 
There was an honest-to-goodness, real Holy Ghost revival on the island of Barva off the coast of Ireland. I probably just said the wrong place, but I think it was Ireland. The Hebrides. Not the New Hebrides. And it was two shut-in widow ladies that prayed down that revival. They got a hold of their pastor and they said, Pastor, you need to have such and such evangelist. You need to have this man come in and preach to our church. They couldn't even go to the church. But they were praying for revival. He called the man. The man said, I've got three years of meetings. I can't do, I can't come until three years from now. He said, will you pray about it? He said, well, I'll pray about it. But (laughs) I booked up a long way. This was in the 50s, the 1950s, not back when it was me, the 1850s, 1950s. He prayed about it, and they prayed about it. And he came back, and they said to the ladies and said, he's booked up, he can't come. He said, you just keep talking to him. And they kept praying. I don't know how you want to put this in order and how this fits with your theology, or I don't know how you're going to explain this or how, you know, make it feel differently. But that evangelist called that pastor back a few weeks later and said, all of my meetings have been canceled. And he spent three years on those islands preaching. The first night they preached and they went, he preached an evening service. Now this was, a, this, was a, this was the kind of thing we did in Africa. We had six hour church service, okay? I'm not gonna do that. I know when I'm supposed to stop. They, keep, they preached, they started at six in the evening and at midnight they tried to go out the doors and they couldn't get out the doors because 600 people were up against the doors out in the, in the street in front of the church and didn't know why they were there. They just had an impression they should go to the church. That revival started for three years because two widow ladies prayed. It's all they could do. But they did what they could do. So don't say you can't do anything. Let's read our text tonight, Acts chapter 14. And I'm going to do this as as quickly as I can, which is usually not very quick, but I'm going to try. Acts chapter 14, verse 21 Paul has just been stoned to death and the disciples stood around him in verse 20 and he rose up and came back into the city. Verse 21, it says this, Acts 14, 21, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we through much, uh, that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. And after that, they passed throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word uh, in Perga, they went down into Italia and thence sailed to Antioch, from from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come, and they gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. Now, one of these days, because you're sending out missionaries, one of these days, one of your missionaries is going to come home and he's going to do just that. He's going to tell you how God opened the door of the gospel to those people and how people were saved and how people were transformed at how a church was established. He's gonna come back and do that. You don't have to be in Antioch for this to happen. Just to review up until this point, we we see that in in chapter 13 and chapter 14 is what we call the missionary cycle. It's the pattern in the life of the apostle Paul and Barnabas, even though he's called an apostle, we don't normally call Barnabas an apostle. He's called an apostle one time. We don't really call him that. And we don't call these guys missionaries because they were called apostles and we kind of don't know what to do with them really. But this is the pattern for our New Testament missions program. Chapter 13 and chapter 14. Chapter 13, well, let me me do this. In chapter 13, they were recommended to the work by the church in Antioch. There was a couple of things about these men. They were proven men. They were not novices. Now, Paul, when he's teaching Timothy about pastors, he says, not a novice, not a recently converted person. 
not an untrained man that doesn't know what he's doing. These men were proven. Why? Because the Bible said that they were teaching and they were busy about serving in the church in Antioch. Now we know both Barnabas and Paul or Saul at this time, we know if we read the story in the book of Acts up until this moment, they've been busy about spreading the gospel. Uh, Barnabas may not have been a big A apostle, but he had been involved in getting the gospel to several areas. We see this. They were proven men. The Holy Spirit called them. The Holy Ghost called them. The church recognized the call of God upon them. And by the way, you know why I'm telling you these things? Because these things are important. The next time you have somebody stand up and say, I want to go to the mission field. Well, do you want to visit or do you want to be permanently there? Because <laughs> some of us get to go and, 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 and visit a mission field. Last year in November, right around this time, we were on our way or just came back from Portugal. We were on our way. Yeah, right after that, we went to Portugal for two weeks. And we got to visit. The missionary we visited is now home. She's on our church, and she's married to one of the young men. She got married three weeks ago. <laughs> married to one of the young men in our church. But she spent 15 years there serving the Lord. But the Spirit of God called them, and the church recognized the call of God. Do you know what? I know one thing about calling into the ministry is usually the person calling, being called is the last person to really get the message. Usually it's pretty evident. Everybody's looking around going, I wonder when he's going to wake up. I wonder when he's going to realize that God has called him. Because it's already changing his life. It's already doing things in his life. He's already getting busy and, 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 and changing the manner of way he does things and think about things. And God's already working in his heart and the rest of her going, okay, there's another one. He's going to be a preacher. But it's important that the church recognizes the call. And they did. But we see also that the church and the Spirit sent them. The church sent them away, and then it says the Spirit sent them. We cannot attempt to do spiritual work without the presence of the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, that's like going out and sitting in your car expecting it to move somewhere with no gas in it. Or maybe the engine's not even there. I mean, some things are necessary. Motive power is necessary, whether it's electric or gas or diesel or, if you're old enough, maybe you have a charcoal burner. They used to use charcoal in trucks too, you know, but uh, there might be some places in Africa they still do, I don't know. The Spirit of God and the church sent them. They went out through the island of the nation of Cyprus and then into southern Asia Minor. They preached the gospel. In Cyprus, in Salamis, they preached the word. In Paphos, they preached. They were opposed by Elamis, the sorcerer. They preached into Asia Minor, which we call Turkey today. You know, Cyprus sits up in that northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea, and, and they came down there. By the way, why did they go to Cyprus? Did you know that Barnabas was from Cyprus? That's interesting. There are little bits of things like that. You kind of have to put it together because it doesn't say in the beginning of the Acts. Now, when you get to chapter 13, remember that Barnabas is from Cyprus. You know, you have to kind of read the whole book and put, it, put, it, put the bits together. They came to the other Antioch, the one in Pisidia, not the Antioch in Syria where they were sent from, but the other one. They preached in the synagogue and the Gentiles also desired to hear the gospel. The unbelieving Jews stirred up opposition against them. We know what happened. In Iconium... The gospel reaped great rewards when preached. It came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude both of Jews and also of the Greeks believed. They came to Lystra and Lycaonia, the city that long remained in Paul's memory. They healed a lame man and Paul was stoned and left for dead. Derby, the last city on his journey, their stopping point. And when they went back, they started back to Antioch. So here's the pattern for evangelism, for church planting, for doing the work. And why do I say this? You say, well, that's all nice, but I'm not doing that work. It's good to know that a large portion of what the church does financially, you know what's happening with it. Transparency is a good thing. You say, well, it's enough for me to know it's missions, and if I've got this thing I know about missions, and that's enough for me. 
You're just not curious. <laughs> I want to know every little bit. I want to know all of it, you know. And who said that you're not involved in a church plant? You know, all of a sudden you might have one of your members or somebody new comes in and they say, I want to plant a church over in the next city. And then pastor says, why don't you go and help them? And you go, uh, I don't know a thing about it. Well, you would if you read Acts 13 and 14. They contacted people with the gospel. They preached the gospel. They preached the word of God. Acts 13, 32, Acts 14, 7, 21, 25. Although mention is not made anywhere, we know that they baptized the converts. It's hard to imagine that they would ignore the clear teaching and the commission given to the apostles in Matthew 28. I just can't believe that it doesn't happen. You say, well, it has to say it or they didn't do it. Well, there's a lot of things they did that doesn't say. How did they get from Cyprus up to Turkey? Did they swim? Did they get in a whale? That happened once, you know. And pretty much in the same part of the country, the water too, is not too far from there. Because Nineveh is just east of there. So although mention is not made, we know that they baptize people. They would not ignore the command of Christ. You know, in Matthew 28, there's three parts. Teach all nations, make disciples. That's, that's what we're to do, teach the gospel. Make disciples of all people in the world, not according to geopolitical map lines. You know, these map lines, almost none of them were there when Jesus was on the earth and when the, when the apostles went. They would say, you're a missionary to Mozambique. Where's Mozambique? Um, it's in Africa. Where's Africa? Oh, yeah, that's right. I don't know where Africa is. So you're talking about Libya? No. <laughs> Libya is only about 4,000 miles away and still Africa. Big place. It's not geopolitical map lines. It's people groups and languages and cultures. You can be in Mozambique and learn a language and not be able to go 50 miles up the road and talk to those people because those are different people. Even though they're all Bantu stock from 900 years ago, they were all Bantus. But 50, 50 or 60 or 70 miles up the road, these people that speak Shisena, that are Masena people, they don't speak uh, Nyanja or Nyungwe, I should say. Nyungwe. I don't speak Nyungwe. I know one guy that speaks Nyungwe. It's the only guy I know. He's, a, he's an army sergeant. He was in our church. And if he spoke it, I would say, okay, that's the same thing as if you said, you know, Maku or Makund or, you know, any of the other languages. You know. Even though I say I'm a missionary to Mozambique, there's a lot of people I find it really hard to reach because I don't speak their language. Some of those languages don't have Bibles. Then what do you do? Wow. How do you go to someone and tell them the Bible says, and he says, show me? Well, I can show you, but you won't understand it. Well, that's not a good answer. <laughs> Pray for your missionaries, because sometimes they go into countries that are even very involved in very modern countries, and they still have people groups. There's, there's 10,000 people in Portugal, in a little community up on the northeast side of Portugal, that they're only people that speak this little tiny language. I don't know if they have a Bible. Fortunately, most of them speak Portuguese also, but in their, in their head language is Portuguese, but their heart language is that. Mirandela, Mirandes. I don't even know if, I don't know if there's a dictionary in that language. It's passed on word of mouth. We have other problems because we go to a field and, and we say, well, we need Bibles for these people. Well, they, those people speak that language, but they don't read any language. The only reason they can count to 10 is they've got 10 fingers. They, they know how many fingers they have, but they wouldn't be able to say that's 10. This is five and this is five, that's 10. Because they don't know the words for them. They wouldn't be able to write it down. They, they sign their, their things by putting a, a little bit of ink and going with their thumbprint because they can't read and they can't write. There's all kinds of barriers to the gospel. That's why we need to pray for our missionaries that they can overcome these barriers, that they can reach the people with the gospel. The gospel is still transmittable, but we have to, 
Why did, do you, did you ever wonder why the Hebrew, or Hebrews, yeah. Romans chapter 10 says this. Faith cometh by hearing. And then we just, right after we say that, we say, read your Bibles and your faith will grow. It didn't say faith cometh by reading. Wonder why. Because when he wrote that, nobody had a Bible. They had to go hear somebody preach. They had to go hear somebody teach. And in many places, that's all we can do. We were talking about interpreters, which we love to call interrupters. You know, because you speak and then they speak. I was telling the preacher stories, which I'm sure he's heard more stories just like that one. But, you know, how you're, you're preaching along and Yahoo over here that's supposed to be interpreting me, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's lost track and he's talking about something else. You know, I'm preaching the gospel and he said the blue goose went under the green tree and he picked off a mango. And I don't know what he's saying because I don't speak that language. That's why he's my interpreter. We have to go to all nations and preach the gospel, baptizing them, teaching them all things. I preached a whole series of messages at the beginning of the year about what Jesus taught us that we are to teach to others. Specifically, what did Jesus teach? I went through about six or seven different things. Because he said what? He said, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded. That's what we're supposed to teach. We're not supposed to teach our ideas. We're not supposed to teach what we think. I realize that we have to put this all together and be able to make sense out of it. Three points in a poem, and I understand that. No poem tonight, sorry. We're supposed to teach his message. And when we're not teaching his message, we don't have any guarantee of the Spirit of God working in somebody's lives and changing them because of the message. We have to get on his message. We have to get on his program. It's not about getting God on our side. It's about us getting on his side. So it's his message. It's his program. He commanded the church to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They encouraged those that were saved. They contacted people. They were baptized. They taught them. They encouraged those that were saved to continue, confirming and exhorting. They established leadership. That's why it's important the men that we send out as missionaries are men who can establish leadership. Now, if you think that, that there's some other pattern that, you know, if you want to come up with it, you take that up with the Holy Ghost and with Paul. You talk to God about that because this, I'm, te- I'm just te- telling you what the Bible says. And I have no problem with what the Bible says. You say, well, that's because you're a man. Hey, you know. I can tell you what Curtis Hudson said. He said, I love women. I'm half woman. My mom was a a woman and my dad was a man. You know, I'm half woman. I don't say things like that, but he said that, you know. I spent the better part of my life. I'm over 48 years with that lady right there. Don't tell me I don't like women. But let's, let's let's do God's work in God's way. So when we send these men out, we have to send them out capable of of actually establishing the church and putting leadership into place and and being able to teach them. And, you know, 2 Timothy 2.2 was our our verse for our training institute. The things that you've heard of me among many, this is the same commit thought of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2, it's really easy to remember, 2.2.2 and just Timothy, okay? They entrusted them to the Lord on whom they had believed, and they reported back to the church that sent them. Yes, the apostles suffered opposition, stoning, assaults. But as Paul wrote to Timothy near the end of his life, he said, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured... But out of them all the Lord delivered me. And yea, he will, he that, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, Paul said. You see, they confirmed the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. In spite of tribulation, in spite of persecution, continue in the faith. What does this mean for us? Because for this to mean anything to us, it has to mean something to us. For us to be able to take anything away from this evening rather than just saying, well, I went to church and I sat in the pew 
And the, the man spoke and he kept hitting the microphone and making it go poof. You know, I'm not real used to these things. So I'm, you know, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. What does it mean for us? For individuals, it means this. We must be born again, saved by believing the gospel. I like to stick with Bible terminology. And I, 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 I read tracts and about half of them I just put back down. You know, because they use jargon. Well, just accept Jesus in your heart. Well, what does that mean? Do, do I think that in the saved person that Jesus is in their heart? Yes. We have promises about that. Colossians. He dwells in our hearts by faith. But where in the Bible did Paul say, now all of you accept Jesus in your heart? What, did he, what does he say? Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. See, I can deal with that. That's, that's right there on the surface. That's easy for anybody to pick up. You don't have to mine it. You just look down and there's the jewel and you just pick it up and take it home. See, stick with what the Bible says. Then we have a promise that God will use it. Because he said his word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Not my word. Not the preacher's word. Not the deacon's word. Not somebody. This is why I keep telling people. You know, you go out and you start talking to people and you've been taught. To, you know, so many people have been taught to go soul winning and give their testimony of how God saved them. Now, a couple of times Paul did that before a king where he had to answer for his behavior. And he never got away from that, that moment when Jesus saved him on the road. Well, I'll tell you, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. You know, Festus told him, he said, I think you're crazy, Paul. <laughs> In different words, but he said, much learning hath made you mad. You know. I understand that tonight, tomorrow night, I've got my, one of my last classes in my master's degree, and it's making me mad, crazy mad, not angry mad. We must be born again, baptized and participating in a good local Bible-believing church. And you're here on a Wednesday night. I suspect you got most of that right. But if you're not saved, let me tell you, this is a missions meeting. This is about you. Because you're the object of the gospel. You're the object of God's love. For God so loved the world. That's us. That's everybody. He didn't love the planet. He loves his creation in a general way. But the, what, the world that his son died for was the world of men and women. Boys and girls. As individuals, we must find our place in the evangelistic program of the church. And get busy about helping to reach others for Christ. I told you, participation in world missions. As a church, we must be involved in the same work as the missionary. Preaching the gospel, bringing others to the saving knowledge of Christ and faith in Jesus Christ. Baptizing them, teaching them all things. Teaching the church to reach the world. As a church, we must be involved also in the mission projects and evangelistic projects that fit the biblical pattern. I've met a lot of missionaries, uh, uh, good people. Uh, somebody called himself a missionary, came to Africa. Uh, he was in our home. He ate meals with us. We, uh, wonderful young couple. Well, he said, well, I'm a missionary. I said, what's your job here? What are you doing? He said, well, I'm teaching farmers to, to farm better. So I asked him the obvious question. How many corn plants did you baptize this week? He didn't like it. He thought I was being, making fun of him. Please don't tell him. I was making fun of him. Why? Because he didn't get it. He plowed right off into the next field. You say, well, he's there to teach them to farm in case someone asks him about the gospel and he can tell them. Well, that's a roundabout way to spend $8,000 a month and live high off the hog. And just line up with everybody else and say, I'm missionary. What did you do? Well, I planted fields. 
Paul would say he should have been planting churches. Should have been pre reaching the go people with the gospel. So it's important that we get on the right program, God's program, preaching the gospel, establishing saved and baptized into congregations, into churches, teaching and training the saved to go and do likewise. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2.2, 2 Timothy, right? Everyone has a part. All must be involved. Praying, going, giving. You know what, as a missionary, and, I, and I'm stopping because that clock says it's time to stop right now. As a missionary, I didn't choose which one of those that I would do. I, I did all three. I went and I prayed for others. And I gave missions money to other people. I know that you're in a Faith Promise program. I learned Faith Promise early in the 80s. When I came out of Portugal, out of the military, and went to a church over in Ohio where I got where, where I was trained, and they taught us faith promise. Kathy and I didn't hardly know anything about it. We were still just trying to get giving down at all. But we decided to pray about it, and we came up with the same figure after we'd pray about it, and we said, well, we'll do that. I think we started with $50 a month. We didn't have $50 a month. Not extra money. Were those people that you hear the stories about where people would drop off groceries, knock on your door, and then run away? Were those people? God had, to, God had to take care of us. There was just too many times when the kids would sit down at the table and mom would just look at them and go, I don't know. I'm sure we'll eat something. I just don't know what it is. No stove, no, no refrigerator in the house. Cooked on a little two-burner stove top thing, had a cooler of ice sitting over there in the corner. I'm not looking for pity. Listen, God taught us faith through those things. I wouldn't trade those memories for anything that you would give me. I would not trade them because those are faith building moments. Fortunately, we didn't have to go through them too many times because we learned pretty quick the first time. <laughs> so we, we gave, we pray for missionaries. I just picked up some new prayer cards right tonight. I got a couple of new ones right here off the board. Some new people to pray for. But we also went 30 years on the field. It's not enough. I could retire. I'm 67 in a couple of weeks. I could quit. Is 67 old, brother? I don't even know. I, I, I don't know. Is 67 old, brother? <laughs> I'll pick on somebody that's older than me. You know? <laughs> He's probably 68. Um, <laughs> can I tell you this as we close? All people may do something. Find your place. Dig a trench. Get in your trench and fight on. No one must do everything. But everyone must do something. Amen. Father, bless tonight, I pray. Thank you for this people so patient with me tonight. God, thank you for the word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for these inspired words that we can read tonight. And even though 2,000 years later, their, their truth remains the same. God, help us to get ourselves on your program. Help us to be busy. Help us to find our place in your program. And Lord, help us to stand fast and not move, holding the word out to a faithless generation that we live in. God, I pray that you'd continue to work in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. As our heads are bowed just for a moment, I'm asked the pastor to come to the pulpit. I don't know how you want to close tonight, preacher, but with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, just consider the message. Ask yourself the question, where my place is? And then ask yourself, am I in my place? Preacher, would you come, please?